Hello, my friends, and welcome to today's video where we'll be taking a deep dive into the new player experience for Roblox is Unbreakable. A little while ago in a Q&A, some people asked me if Roblox is Unbreakable was going to be effectively my replacement for YBA, and at the time, I said no. Um, and, uh, and take a look at this. Amazing, mission complete. So I'm not just gonna flat out say that this is my YBA replacement, but what I am gonna say is, um, well, my choices are this, YBA, or AUT. AUT hasn't gotten an update in 40,000 years and they're rewriting their whole game. YBA, not even gonna touch on that. Yeah, here we are. So to the Roblox is Unbreakable devs who are probably watching this, uh, yikes, yeah, uh, sorry in advance. But hey, I hope what I say can help. Now the other question on your mind is probably, Eclipse, why the hell are you talking about the new player experience? I feel like you've already covered this ad nauseum. And while that's sort of true, I went back through the whole thing again, not only to see how much has changed, but also to see how little has changed and explain exactly why I feel like some things should change. The thing about the new player experience is that it's very easy to overlook this the longer the game goes on. It's very easy for the developers to just sort of assume that most people by now have gotten to level 100, and so they can add content that only affects people that are past 75 or so and not worry about the rest of the people. I mean, they'll get there eventually, right? Right? And therein lies the biggest problem. I think that RIU's new player experience is extremely flawed and is highly susceptible to actively drive away players. And I think the last thing that the game wants to be doing is to not be bringing in new people. Because new content is great, especially to bring back old players, but if you're not bringing in new players and the ones that are coming in are potentially getting driven away, well, I think you can kind of see where the problem here is. It's also easy to overlook it because, again, it hasn't really been worked on for a very long time, and the people working on stuff are actively working on things that have nothing to do with this entire area of the game. I mean, how much realistically has been done with Phantom Blood since the game launched? Probably not a whole lot, huh? The background footage that I'll be using to show off my points is footage that I'll be using for a completely different video later, so look forward to that at some point. But regardless, I think it's prudent to kick things off with the number one thing that you'll notice immediately upon playing, and also one of the things that I'm sure is incredibly difficult to band-aid fix. And because of that, it likely just never will be fixed, which is a shame. And that problem is the massive large stretches of land that you need to go across in order to get from place to place. The problem with these massive stretches of land is that there's nothing to them and they just don't provide anything to the gameplay. Especially at the beginning of the game when you don't have any money. So your only option is to traverse these large stretches of empty land. Let me ask you, what exactly is the purpose of going to the Joestar Mansion and then having to walk all the way to London? I just legitimately sat here for about two or three minutes after asking that question myself, and I'm coming up empty. I really don't know. The only answer that I can potentially think of is that it was made this way specifically to pad out playtime, but for a new player, that feels like the last thing you wanna be doing. That's usually the kind of thing that you do later on down the line after people are actually invested, not before they've become invested. You don't wanna bore people quickly and having them have to cross huge stretches of nothing consistently, well, it's just not a good look. Now, when we actually get to London, things just do not improve. In fact, arguably, I think they get worse. And that's because the very first real quest you get in the game has very little direction. Which, once again, for completely new people who are just getting into the game, yeah, I can see a lot of people quitting here. Which is a real shame, because they don't get to play the rest of the game if they do. The problem is that the quest that you get here is unlike any quest that you'll get for the entire rest of the game. You're asked to go to London to find someone who knows about the poison that poisoned Jonathan's father. You find Speedwagon and he says, I'll tell you about the poison, but you need to get me $1,500 first. And then after that, 
Well, that's it. You need to get $1,500. Seeing as by this point in the game, there's no way to be past like level two unless you sat there and farmed the same dummy or Dio over and over and over again at the spawn. The only way to get money is to randomly find it on the ground by killing NPCs or getting up to level five in order to get a random side quest which will grant you money if you kill five NPCs. Now here, I think I have a few ideas as to why they decided to go about it the way they did, but I don't agree with the reasoning for it, assuming it's true. My only running theory is that when you get to this point, the developers wanted you to learn that money drops on the ground, and so you can pick up items and such. They wanted you to learn about side quest NPCs that you can use to level up, and they wanted you to learn that killing random NPCs gives you experience and money. That's my assumption of what they were trying to do here. The problem is that that sort of falls flat when the only quest objective is obtain $1,500. If the goal was to show you that items spawn on the ground and that you can do side quests and that killing NPCs rewards you, surely there was a better way to go about that than just tell someone, get me $1,500. I just feel like there had to have been. But then again, a few of those things I feel like you would just learn by playing the game anyway. Surely you'd have to run across an item at some point, and then you would learn that items spawn on the ground. Surely at some point, you'd run into an NPC that would give you a side quest. And better yet, why not put that NPC that gives you the side quest at the very start of London, so that way you can't miss it. And then you know about side quest NPCs now. And you can show that NPCs grant you XP and money, without having to hand over a bunch of money. What I'm getting at is I think it would make way more sense if you went up to Speedwagon and he said something along the lines of, hey, can you take care of these gangsters for whatever reason, list your reason here, and if you do, then I'll tell you the secret of the antidote. That way you have a specific goal. There are enemies around here, and if you fight them, then I'll give you the antidote. The other problem with the current $1,500 quest is that you get a lot of new players grouping up in this city all trying to fight over the same NPCs. And while yes, if you both fight the NPC and both do enough damage, you'll both get rewards, what isn't touched on is that if somebody kills the NPC before you get there, you're liable to run into it and it will already be dead. The issue here, the NPCs just take too long to respawn as it is. Even if the quest was changed and it asked you to kill a specific amount of NPCs in order to move on, you would still run into the problem of just wandering around London hoping you can find enemies to fight. Which from a player perspective, especially someone who has no idea what they're doing and is completely new, is probably not a whole lot of fun. For me personally, somebody who's already done all of this before, even despite that, I still spent a little over 20 minutes wandering through London looking for NPCs to kill in order to get the $1,500 in order to move on. That's for somebody who already knows all of this stuff and doesn't need to learn anything new. I think in an ideal world, London has more than just one singular quest in it, seeing as it feels like it should be a bit of a more major location, but seeing as it only has one quest, you really shouldn't be here for this long. Especially not doing something so exceedingly boring as wandering around the city hoping you can find people to fight. The only other two things to mention about London is the absolutely absurd invisible wall over here. Like, I can literally see down the street. Could we not have just put an actual wall here? I'll never understand RIU's obsession with invisible walls. I really don't. And the fact that there's still a shop in here that can still sell you items that could actively screw you over. I appreciate the fact that they show the arrow percentage chances when you actually have an arrow now, so you don't just have to guess. But this arrow chance doesn't show until you've bought an arrow. So that doesn't really solve the problem. If they didn't want you to have stands during part one, they really should have just made it so that you can't get arrows until later and then forget about the whole arrow fail chance. I'm not sure why we're so attached to the fail chances of items. Maybe it has to do with some sort of monetary gain. I'm not sure, but it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense that we're having arrows fail. I've heard the cannon excuse a few times, and listen, if we were trying to do cannon, then you would just be able to stop time and instantly kill the other person, and that probably wouldn't be very much fun. 
Using canon as an excuse to have bad game design doesn't usually hold up very well. Regardless, we wrap up London, and now we've got to go back to the Joestar Mansion. Thankfully, this time, since we're actually a slightly higher level and have money, you can use the fast travel to get back, so you don't need to walk. The fast travel would be unnecessary if the walk wasn't so long, but hey, at least it's here. After you get back to the mansion, you talk to Jonathan, and he tells you, hey, go talk to Zapelli. Well, that was kind of pointless, but okay, whatever. Now we'll go do that. You talk to Zapelli, and he tells you where to go, but doesn't recommend going there until you've gotten Haman. And he'll teach you, but you're gonna need to give him $2,000. Now, wait a minute. I just had to farm up $1,500 and give it away to Speedwagon. He takes that $1,500. And now, after I've completed the quest and don't have near $2,000, you're saying I shouldn't go to the next area until I've gotten $2,000 to pay for this? Well, okay, so if I wanted to get Haman like the game actively recommends you to do, my best course of action would be to go back to London to farm more NPCs and wander around the city for another 20 plus minutes. If it took me 20 minutes the first time to get $1,500, there's no reason it's not gonna take me just as long to get the next $2,000 to unlock Haman. So now you're at a crossroads, you have two choices. You either get Haman and farm for another 20 minutes, or you move on without it and don't unlock any new moves or make the game any more interesting. This is a bad spot for a new player to be. Usually, you would front load some sort of interesting thing at the beginning of the game in order to keep people's attention. Just walking around punching things with your fist isn't super interesting and not very engaging. So it would be at this point, if I was starting from scratch, that I would just give players access to Haman without having to pay any sort of money for it. I'm not quite certain of what the purpose of locking this behind $2,000 is, other than later on when you want to get different specs and you might reset yours and come back here to get Haman. But that being said, $2,000 is a completely negligible amount at later points of the game. But here, it's massive. So like, there's two extremes. There's the beginning of the game where 2,000 is a ton of money, and then once you unlock trials especially, then money almost means nothing and it's stupid easy to get it. So what's the point of charging the $2,000? I'm not sure. It's not like it's realistic to get enough money to get anything else that you'd be able to use that would be new and interesting. Both the Vampire Mask and the Stand Arrow are pretty expensive, much more expensive than Haman is, so you're not likely to get those. So it's almost a no-brainer to get this, but then it's more of a grind. So again, this rough situation where you get something shiny and new, but you're gonna have to go back and grind stuff you were already grinding for 20 minutes, or you just say, screw it, I hope I get more interesting stuff later and continue on with the quest. I don't know, it just doesn't really make very much sense. Because of the nature of what I was doing, I didn't get Haman and I continued on with nothing something that I didn't do my first time through. But also this time around, I had a better understanding of the fighting mechanics, which made playing the game a little bit easier. That being said, before we move on at all, there is something that I feel like I have to mention here and may honestly get its own video, it's so important, but I am gonna touch on it here. And that's that your M1 attacks, if you're not using the Pluck Sword, are so scuffed. They barely work. There are many times where you are standing directly in front of an enemy and you throw out attacks and they just don't do any damage. This applies to normal attacks as well as stand attacks. When it first started happening, I thought it was a fluke, but on further review, yeah, this happens a lot. It makes it basically required to get the Pluck Sword, which we'll talk about later, and it also generally just makes the game significantly less consistent, which is really, really bad for overall combat. I don't know how this stuff happens, it doesn't seem to be distance related, but regardless of how it happens, this really needs to get fixed. It is a massive issue. Regardless, your next quest is pretty tame. It tasks you with killing 10 zombies, and assuming that you had Haman at this point, this would be a great quest for an introduction to your moves. If we're working under the impression that you get Haman for free rather than having to pay for it, and now you're able to use it here, this will be the first moment where you potentially get to try out some new moves you've unlocked. 
The zombies are a bit spread out and probably take too long to respawn, but either way, I don't have too much complaints here. After the zombie quest, we get our first level gate. Although this level gate is basically meaningless because I don't think there's any way to get to this point without already being past level 10. So the level 10 level gate in order to fight Bruford doesn't really mean much. You go to Zapelli, talk to him, he says, go fight Bruford, and you do so. Bruford should be one of those introductory boss fights where you start to learn about boss fights and the more intricate mechanics of the game. Unfortunately, on a public server, it isn't this at all, and for very good reason. That's because Bruford, as it stands, is the only way for you to get the Pluck Sword. And the Pluck Sword is the only current weapon in the game, which means that there is basically zero reason not to get it. There are no alternatives. That means that very often, Bruford is swamped with players, oftentimes being very high levels. Those people, of course, are trying to grind Bruford in order to get the sword. And the thing about obtaining the Pluck Sword is that it is mountains of levels of fucked up. I gotta go on a bit of a side rant here because there's no way I can't. But the way you get the Pluck Sword makes no fucking sense. According to the Trello, it's a 5% drop chance when Bruford dies. Now this in of itself wouldn't be too bad. You kill it a bunch of times, eventually it drops the Pluck Sword and that's sort of the end of it. 5% is ridiculous and the fact that it's a main quest NPC that every new player has to fight in order to get past and so a lot of them won't actually experience the boss fight because the boss will be getting deleted by level 100 players kind of sucks, but really it's not that big of a deal until you realize how it actually works. When Bruford dies and drops the Pluck Sword, it's not a per player drop. It is a global drop. It's not instance based. That means that anybody can pick it up and once somebody does, nobody else can get it. What the f***? Why would they do that? I genuinely don't understand. I don't think there's any items in the entire game that function like this. And if there are other ones, that's equally as fucked up. I got really lucky and had the sword drop for me and I grabbed it and I immediately ran away and felt a little bit bad that I'd yoinked the sword from all these level 100s who, for all I know, might not even understand how it works. They may have been working under the same impression I was when I first tried to get the sword, which is, if I just kill it, sometimes I'll randomly get it. But nope, it's a global drop. Why? Regardless of the pluck sword nonsense, this is also the part of the game where we get to our first level lock. And level locks are probably the biggest issue that Roblox is Unbreakable has, especially for its new player experience. Overall, I'm not entirely sure what the purpose of the level locks on a lot of these things are. So if the developers want to tell me, or if you guys want to theorize in the comments, especially after I've explained myself here, feel free. But as it stands right now, I don't get it, and I'm very lost as to why it doesn't work differently than how it does. After you defeat Bruford for the first time, you'll go back to the Zapelli NPC, and he'll tell you to go talk to Jonathan. Jonathan is at the top of the hill at Dio's castle, and the quest from him is to fight against Dio. The problem is, the only way to get this quest is to reach level 15. You are completely locked off from going to fight Dio until you've reached level 15. And if you've just done the story quests up until now, there is no possible way that you can be level 15 by this point. The extra confusing part is that until now, there have been zero quests that have been level gated. So far, you've just done a quest, then gone to an NPC, and they've sent you to go do another quest. But all of a sudden, you get here and the game says, nope, you gotta do the same quest you just did but again. And this issue is even more relevant when you consider the fact that it takes the boss three minutes to respawn. That may not sound like a whole lot of time, but you're not doing anything during the three minutes that it takes this NPC to respawn. You are quite literally standing here doing nothing. So we're about 30, 40 minutes into the game, and so far you've unlocked 
potentially no abilities and you're at a point where you're fighting against a boss but you're not even really fighting against it because in all likelihood there's a bunch of people standing around insta killing it over and over again and then you have to stand around and wait for three minutes like four or five separate times you're just standing here doing absolutely nothing that impression cannot be good for someone who is completely unacquainted with the game entirely. And the odd part about it is that it just doesn't have to be this way on so many levels. I've been told in the past that RIU's game plan, in a sense, was to try to make a JoJo RPG in the vision of the developers. But I don't know about you guys, maybe I'm just playing the wrong RPGs, but how many RPGs have you played where the game makes you replay main story quests in order to access the next ones? In my experience, usually the way that games try to block you from moving on too quickly is make it so that the next part of the game is really, really difficult if you haven't grinded. So if you're particularly skilled, you can go on to the next part of the game and get through it anyway, under leveled. But if you're not, then you can spend the time to grind and get some more levels in order to make the next boss easier. That way, the difficulty isn't a slider, but rather how much time you spend. Here, though, the problem is you don't get that choice whatsoever. There's no option to move on unless you've grinded. You have to grind. And this is the part where I have to bring up double XP weekends, because I know there's going to be people that tell me that double XP is like the way you get through this game. And on that same vein, you can also buy double XP from the shop, which I assume is part of the reason that this is as bad as it is. My assumption is that they wanted people to buy double XP, so they tried to make leveling kind of miserable to entice you to do it. From a business perspective, this may make sense in the short term, but when you think about it a little more long term, and especially consider the fact that people may just get very tired of this very quickly and then not bother continuing with the game because they can't move forward, then you can potentially start to see the problems that this actually causes. There is no point in this game where I feel like the level gates are even remotely necessary. I think it would make way more sense if the prerequisite to move on was completing the previous quest, not level gating you so that you can't move on. And then if you can't handle the significant increase in challenge, then you can go back and potentially retry quests to get more XP to make your life a little bit easier. But at the end of the day, standing around doing absolutely nothing for about 12 or so minutes is just not a good look for new players. Not at all. And from here, it doesn't improve. When you go up to Dio's castle and talk to Jonathan, you get the quest to fight Dio. You go in there, you fight him, and unlike the Bruford boss, you might actually be able to fight the Dio boss, because as far as I know, he doesn't have any drops. So there's not a bunch of level 100 standing around that can carry you through the boss. Assuming this is the case, most new players are going to get absolutely thrashed here because they haven't really learned much about the game because the first real boss of the game is completely bypassed because people are farming for the Pluck Sword. But that's besides the point. Assuming you get past the Dio boss, you probably are thinking to yourself, all right, well, what next? What's next is the next part, part five, Ventor Reo. Problem is, despite the fact that you just finished the storyline, you're done with Phantom Blood, you can't leave yet. You need to fight Dio again and again and again. The same boss that you've already fought. You cannot move forward until you've killed Dio multiple times. And that, of course, means waiting more spawn timers. I just want to make it clear, though, the problem here is not the spawn timers. The spawn timers should be lower for those who want to grind, but a spawn timer reduction does not fix this problem. The problem is that you're stuck and can't move on no matter how much you want to. It is strictly a waste of your time. Now, after you've finally defeated Dio enough times that you can move on to Vento Areo, we can go over there and take a look at how things just, again, don't really improve very much.
Assuming that we live in my ideal world and you're coming to Vento Arreo with the Haman spec because you got it for free, so it was basically unavoidable, you may potentially be getting bored of Haman by now. Or at the very least, you want something new being dangled in front of your face in order to keep you interested as somebody who's completely new. And this, presumably, is where stands are supposed to come in. Except for, maybe they won't. Because you have to specifically go out of your way to get a stand during Vento Arreo. I think that this is an extreme flaw. In my opinion, after starting Vento Arreo, either directly after talking to Koichi or right after killing Giorno, you should be given an arrow that has a 100% chance of succeeding regardless of level. All arrows should be that way, but if they're so hung up on keeping arrows the way they are, at the very least, you should get a guaranteed stand to keep you engaged in the game. New stuff is always going to be exciting, and especially when it stands, which are basically the main draw of this game anyway. Anyways, for the rest of this, I'm gonna assume you have a stand, because you should. Moving forward, this is where the running really starts to get out of hand and is just wholly unnecessary. After you defeat Giorno, you talk to him and he tells you to meet him somewhere else. So you run halfway across the map and talk to Giorno and he tells you, okay, go defeat Leaky Luca. And now you have to traverse the entire map. So then you run all the way across the entire map or take the fast travel, which frankly, again, as I said earlier, shouldn't even be necessary. Fight Luca and he's just a stupidly easy boss. You defeat him in seconds and then you're moving forward. After you defeat him, you have to go back to Giorno. So you walk all the way back across the whole map, talk to Giorno, and then he tells you, hey, meet me at the train station. So then you need to go back the way you came again, halfway past the map to meet the other Giorno who then tells you to fight Bruno. Now, here's the question. Why couldn't we have just made it so that after you defeat Giorno, you talk to him and then the Giorno that you defeated assigns you with the Luca quest and then you can go straight there. And then after you defeat Luca, make it so that, I don't know, maybe in the previous dialogue box with Giorno, he says, after you deal with that, meet me at the train station. So then you go to the train station and talk to Giorno and then you get the quest to defeat Bruno. That removes a lot of walking and running back and forth that just doesn't need to be there whatsoever. I just want to stress this again. This isn't for me. This is for new players of this game. I just want to make it clear that the longer that people are running back and forth from locations not doing anything, the longer that people are not getting new abilities, and the longer that people are waiting for enemies to respawn, the more likely they are to quit and go play something else. I think that those things should be heavily reduced, that way people are more likely to continue to play. Regardless, now's the Bruno fight, which in my opinion is way too hard, but whatever, I don't think that's gonna change anytime soon, so so be it, I suppose. You defeat Bruno, then he sends you to himself. You go talk to him, and for once, the next quest that you need to do is extremely close to the one you just did. You simply walk out the cafe and go to the right, and there's the next quest giver, Mista. I wish the rest of the game worked this way. Now, with the Mista quest unlocked, this is where we start running into Pointless Level Gates version 2.0. This time around, being slightly improved compared to before, mostly because I ragged on this a lot before, and I'm gonna rag on it again because it still doesn't make any sense. Yes, now there are more NPCs for you to fight, and yes, now they don't take as long to respawn, so you can get through this quest much quicker. That being said, what exactly is the purpose of making you consistently redo these quests? What exactly is added to the game when you have to redo these quests? I can tell you one thing that can be added, a higher likelihood of someone who's playing through to just call it quits and not want to play anymore. Both the Mista and Abakio quests, which effectively assign you the exact same task, go fight five NPCs that are liable to never pose any sort of a challenge whatsoever, should not have to be repeated any amount of times unless you're actively trying to grind to get more levels so that way the game is easier for you because you're struggling. 
If you're doing fine as it is, or you're content with the challenge of being underleveled, you shouldn't be forced to play the same quests over and over again. Especially not these ones, where there's basically just no challenge or anything involved. There's no way you can lose here. You can't. I don't know how you would ever lose here. And because of that, it just feels pointless. And once again, just like in Phantom Blood, it's really confusing as to why they just arbitrarily decided we're gonna put level gates here, despite the last few quests not requiring them, as far as I know, seemingly at all. I think I accidentally killed Bruno twice, so I happened to get to a high enough level that I was bypassing the first real level gate. But regardless, you go through the Giorno fight and the Luca fight without getting gated off. And then you get here, and all of a sudden it's like someone completely different wrote this part of the game, and they were like, eh, we need to pad this out a little bit longer, so let's just make it unnecessarily grindy for no reason. And of course, in case it wasn't clear, the problem doesn't go away until you're completely done with the game. After the Ibakio quest, you go to fight Risotto, you fight him, and then you're level gated again. You can't move on to the final boss unless you've killed this boss enough times. And this boss, once again, has the same problems with all the other repeatable bosses in the game, where you have to wait for it to respawn, so you just stand around doing absolutely nothing. I'll never understand why the respawn timers for these bosses aren't like 10 to 15 seconds. Like, what is there to gain by making it so that you have to stand here and wait for it to come back? I really don't understand. Is it strictly entirely about trying to sell double XP? Or is there really something going on here that I'm missing? Because as far as I can tell, standing around doing absolutely nothing just is not fun. The way you hook new players onto a game is not by making them wait and stand there and do nothing. Regardless, after grinding through the risotto quest, you get access to trials as well as the final enemy in the game, or final quest as of the recording of this video, which is of course to fight Diavolo. You go talk to Giorno, Giorno gives you a quest, and then he asks you if you're ready to fight Diavolo. You go in, you fight him, and I mean, I suppose that's it, at least for the storyline. That's not it for leveling though, because there's a few extra level gates that you need to get past. A few extra level gates that, quite honestly, as I've said earlier, are just not necessary, and could be way better handled if they just required a completely different prerequisite. It's pretty clear that the developers want you to fight Diavolo, then level up enough with Diavolo so that you're comfortable fighting a new harder boss, then fight Dio, and then after you've fought Dio, fight the hardest current boss, which is Jotaro Part 4. The thing I don't understand is why the game didn't just decide to lock each trial by completing the subsequent trial that comes before it. Rather than making an arbitrary level requirement to fight Dio, why didn't they make it so that you need to beat Diavolo first? And then, if you want to fight Jotaro Part 4, then you beat Dio. This solves two issues. Number one, it makes it so that friends that are playing together can all play the same trials, and it also means that skilled players who are able to beat bosses that are much further along than they otherwise should be can attempt that challenge for a potentially higher reward. And this kind of anti-level gate philosophy works towards the Steel Ball Run game mode as well. Why not make it so that you can access Steel Ball Run after defeating Jotaro Kujo Part 4? That's the last real milestone in the game that you can reach, and then after that is Steel Ball Run. Going into Steel Ball Run underleveled is all but suicide, especially against the much higher leveled level 100 players. But that being said, if you want to play Steel Ball Run with somebody who hasn't gone through the whole grind, and even if they want to play at a disadvantage, they should be allowed to do that, rather than just being completely locked out. I mean, I'm just spitballing here, and maybe these are some of the worst ideas that you've ever heard, but I genuinely think that everything that I've said in this video would make it so that people coming into the game would be more likely to stay. Because that's the big problem with RIU right now. The problem is, despite however good the content that they add, 
add later on down the line is, it doesn't fix the major issues with the early game that are gonna drive away people that are completely new. And it's incredibly important that you never forget that there are consistently new people coming into these games. It's never going to be just veterans, no matter how long the game has been active for. Anyways, that's my whole spiel on the entirety of the RIU new player experience. I'm really, really hoping that the developers end up seeing this and decide to make some meaningful changes so that way new players feel less alienated and it doesn't waste as much of their time. But hey, who knows? For all I know, this could have been one big monetary scheme and everything is specifically made to make as much money as possible and maybe the numbers really show that people are more likely to pay for stuff and that's why the systems are the way they are. I don't necessarily think that's the case, but maybe that's why, and maybe that's why everything is so rough. Or maybe it's just a matter of stubbornness, where they don't want to change what they already had because they feel the way they have it is right, in which case I heavily disagree, but I'm still one person. So maybe I don't represent the majority even though I think I do. I don't have a clue. But really, only time will tell when it comes to the results of this video. I made it in hopes that I could help, and whether it does or not is out of my hands. That's all for today though, so if you did enjoy the video and you liked the ideas I had, share the video around, leave a like, and subscribe. If you didn't, don't do those things. And with all that being said, have a wonderful day or night wherever you are, and I'll see you guys next time.